updated, but with the weather, it can be expected. So I've got quite a few messages from our people who were planning on being here in person and are now doing it virtually, which is an awesome part of this hybrid, is it allows that flexibility. So we thank you and we just want everyone to stay safe. That's kind of our key thing here. So um, I want to acknowledge you all for being here and thank you. I know this is a very busy time of year and that there are a lot of training options, but we hope that you can find value in attending Suavo, not only in the knowledge um, that is presented, but really in the networking if you don't know your fellow advocates. And so in our like goal to always encourage the networking, we're gonna have a lot of breakout rooms today. And so we hope that you stick with them and you are present during those breakout groups and that you get to know kind of your fellow advocates. I know so much through my career, I learned from people when they would share their expertise or their perspective. And it really, oh, I like their style and I would engage in further conversations you know, reach out to them when I had questions about cases and how to handle things or when I still need work out. So um, Swabo is a really good network to be able to do that, to reach outside of your own agency, to meet with other people. Um, don't hesitate to ask if you can come shadow somebody. I think that's another great thing. If you hear somebody and you like their comments and you're like, oh, I think they know what they're doing. Um, a lot of times that's a great opportunity to reach out and say, hey, can I just come showering for the day? Can I check out what you're doing? Um, I would like to see how we're doing things different. So I think that's a big part of Swallow. And I want to thank Maddie, of course, for all of her technical assistance. Uh, she is a lifesaver. If you need anything during the training today, um, please don't hesitate to ma um, email myself um, or Maddie, and we can try to help you out with any issues that you're having. I, I know I have a couple emails sitting there from folks, but I will get to them as soon as I sit down. So um, continue to email that. I want to thank our mic. Does the mic not on? Can they not hear? No, it's um, you're too far. I'm sure I can't read that whole. You're just too far from monologue. It. OK. Um, I wanted to thank my steering committee. They really are amazing. Um, they meet quarterly with me and we review all of your evaluations. So anything, the surveys that we have you fill out, we really do review them. We take from them suggestions. So if you have comments, good or bad, we want to know them. Um, and if you can give us a little bit more details versus like, hey, this isn't working, um, we really will try to work on it. And our favorite thing about those uh, surveys is where you provide like what you would like to be trained on, what kind of presentations you would like to see, who are presenters you want us to bring in um, so we can look at that for future swallows. Um, and then I think that's all I have this morning. So I think we are ready unless there's any questions from our virtual attendees or in the room. Restrooms are on this side for our in-person attendees. Um, I'm going to turn our time over to our first presenter. I am really, I'm, I probably told her too many times that it's now creepy, but I am like such a fan and I am so excited about this topic. And I wish I would have learned it much earlier on in my career. And so um, she, Melinda is here and is going to talk to us about epigenetics. And, and I know I probably... Did I pronounce that incorrectly even? Uh, I think it's epigenetics. Okay, okay yeah. close. Um, and so I will turn the time over to Melinda now and we'll go ahead and get started for the day. Thanks. Well, thanks, Michelle. So I've never done a hybrid format before. Um, I'm open to all the feedback. If you can't hear me, if I'm not catching what's happening up there, just let me know. Um, and also anybody that wants to move up, I, mean, I, I have like maybe like 10 $1 bills in my wallet. I will even pay you. It feels so lonely way up here. Um, I'm laughing too, because as I was looking up at the screen, there's so many names that I recognize virtually. And so it's really nice to be here. I think, I think so frequently in these types of trainings, our paths cross so often that sometimes like I know where I know you from or you're like, I think I've seen you before, but it's really lovely to be here with you all. My name is Melinda. Um, I, I was joking with Michelle. I'm like, man, are people like wildly sick of trauma yet? Cause it's 
everything, right? But one of the things that I, I always say is I loved when trauma became the focus of my career because there's so much science, like hard science to support what we're doing. And so much of psychology has been a lot of guesswork. Like even now, I only send my clients that need med management to prescribers that do a genetic test that will immediately filter out what they can metabolize and what they can't based on their epigenetics. So um, but anyway, I think that's really interesting. We can talk more about it as we go, but I get really excited about topics like epigenetics and the science behind what we're doing um, in the helping professions and in psychology because it's not as much guesswork as it used to be. And my hope today is a couple of things. Number one, um, I don't know that anyone will walk away feeling as um, geekily excited about epigenetics and intergenerational trauma as I get, but I hope you will leave and feel like, oh my God, that makes so much sense to me about myself or my family or the people I work with, that it will connect some dots for you. And even in some ways, when I use intergenerational historical and epigenetics work with my own clients, I just see relief come across them in a way that is just absolutely delightful. So I hope that you all will have some of that happen for you today. Um, I joked with Rochelle that some of the uh, hard science in this is not actually that entertaining. And I have honestly worked really hard to try to make it as entertaining as I possibly can. But I'm a big fan of do what you need to do. If you need to stand up, if you need to stretch, if you need to go get a drink, if you need to check in with your babysitter and see how things are going, please do that. All of those things help us get in our window of tolerance. So we're going to spend a few minutes with the window of tolerance today. Again, I know that that, that information is mostly review for you all. Uh, Rochelle said that there's a huge variety of expertise in the room. I love to start off by saying, I know I'm bringing some things to the table, but I know that you all are bringing probably more to the table. And so please share, please comment, please, um, please know that I know there are experts in the room and on the screen. Um, an introduction to me, uh, my name is Melinda Pettengill. I started my work um, as an LCSW almost 20 years ago. I, um, I started at the YWCA um, downtown doing advocacy work um, in domestic violence um, dynamics. I've worked in the prison and the jail. Um, I, I did a lot of program. Um, oh, why, why am I forgetting what this is called? Also, I have a terrible cold and I'm on cold medicine up here, but I, I've had it for six weeks and my doctor wildly assured me on Monday, I have no contagious anything in me. So I'll stay up here, but but uh, my doctor says I'm not contagious anymore. Um, so I, I moved up to um, the University um, Neuropsychiatric Institute and did some programming with chronically suicidal, chronically um, homicidal mental, um, mental health issues and did some reprogram design based on trauma models. And then I was the clinical director at the Rape Recovery Center for a long time. And I currently work in private practice and um, teach trauma courses um, in the MSW program at the U. Um, so I, I kind of eat, breathe, drink trauma. And um, as I'm sure many of you do, we always have to kind of keep that jazzed up and make it a little bit more exciting. So that's an intro to me. One of the things I always say is that the beauty of trauma work is we're really navigating a nervous system, even more so than a person. And so, um, I, I don't mean that in a dehumanizing way, but we know what to do with nervous systems. And so we're going to talk a little bit this morning, just before we get started, about your nervous system. Raise your hand or raise your hand in the chat or the on your screen. How many of you are familiar with polyvagal theory or have done window of tolerance work? Okay. What's half of you? I, sometimes people don't raise their hands because they're like, Ugh, I don't want her to call on me. I'm not going to call on you. Um, most of these ideas you're, you're mildly familiar with. Some of you, again, are experts in this. So we're going to work with this concept today. Those of you that are in the room, I'm going to have you grab one of the lifesavers in the middle of your table. 
those of you that are not in the room, can they see me if I look at the camera like this? Not creepy, right? Um, grab like a, a glass of water or something that you can touch, play with, um, a pair of keys, anything at all that's in your immediate vicinity, a chapstick, anything will work. Okay, you've all got a lifesaver. We're not gonna use it right off the bat, so um, hold on to it just for a second. And I should have said, don't open it yet. Um, all right. Here's our schedule really quickly. We're gonna do, um, we just did a little intro. We're gonna do a window of tolerance overview. We're gonna talk about epigenetics. We're gonna have a break. I'm, I'm really committed to breaks. So if I start to go into your break time, I want someone to jump up and really start freaking out, okay? Because you should get your breaks at your break time. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about healing intergenerational trauma. We're gonna talk about rat mothers. And we're going to wrap up with questions. Um, the objectives for today, we're going to define epigenetics. Um, again, I'm not going to call on you, but raise your hand if you feel like you have a pretty good understanding of what epigenetics is. Okay, a few of you. Raise your hand if you have heard of epigenetics and you think you might know some of what it is about. Okay, good. Um, we are going to talk about the crossover between epigenetics and intergenerational trauma. They're not the same thing, but they get lumped together a lot. Um, we're going to talk about interpersonal healing and collective healing. I'm a big believer that we're not able to do this stuff with clients, with our families, with our own children, in our relationships, if we're not looking at it inside ourselves. We're not running group therapy today, but I do want you to look inward as we're addressing this topic. Does that make sense? And, and in all the questions I'm gonna have you explore together in your small groups, it's completely optional if you share or not. Um, and then we're gonna talk about our role as providers. Hopefully you will leave today feeling like that's useful to me. I can take that thing out of here and I can do something. I can operationalize that today. Um, I'm not an epigeneticist. So any of you in the room that are like, yeah, she might have missed that definition definition of methylation. I'm, I'm missing my words. Methylation and demethylation, please throw your hand in the air. I'm so happy for us to contribute everything we collectively know. Um, so go back one slide. So I want to talk really quickly about polyvagal theory um, or window of tolerance work. So every single human being at the very base of their spine, the very first part of your brain that develops. Anyone um, ha have children in here or have seen a picture of a sonogram or a baby in utero, fetus? Just raise your hand. So one of the things that's funny about that is the very first thing we can really identify in a photo of a developing fetus or baby, the very first thing you can see is what? The heart beats the thing we focus on, yes. But the thing we can see before that is the beginnings of the skeletal system. Um, I lovingly referred to both of my children as skeletor um, until they started getting like fat on their bodies and you could tell it was a baby, not just a little skeletal system. Um, but the very first part of the brain that develops is the spinal cord. So that's what we see first. And here at the base of the spine, so put your hand back here at the back of your head, here at the base of the spine is the epicenter of your nervous system. And your nervous system splits in two nerves that travel the length of your body. Anybody know what those nerves are called? It's like, it's too early and there's snow everywhere <laughs> and you can't make us talk. Um, so I accept. Um, the, the first nerve is the sympathetic nerve. And the second nerve is the parasympathetic. Yeah, I see some of you mouthing, you knew. So the sympathetic nerve, when it gets activated, so when there's a stimuli, let's say you're driving here, many of you probably have this experience, people are pumping their brakes more than usual because it's icy and it's snowy. The minute you see that light up, there's an, a trigger to your sympathetic nerve that says, act now, do something. It really comes through your pituitary gland and sends that message to your sympathetic nerve. And then you what? You step on your brakes, right? You're like, I see this brake in front of me. I do it. And it's that fast. You don't have to think about it, right? Brilliant. The sympathetic nerve says, act now. And it's not usually conscious, 
when you do it. The parasympathetic nerve shoots down the entire length of your body and does the opposite. It does not say act now, it says shut down, slow it all down. Your greatest chance of survival in this moment is to get sleepy and play dead. So no one doesn't have one or the other of those. You all have a sympathetic nerve and you all have a parasympathetic nerve. And when we get triggered or when there's stimuli that shows up in front of us, if someone's talking louder than you expect them to, or if someone tells you how bad it was, most of you knew I was acting, right? Did anybody have a physiological reaction to me screaming at you just now? Is there any tension, tightness, like, ugh, stop it. Why are you screaming at us? Most of you probably had a parasympathetic, or sorry, a sympathetic response saying, ugh, make it stop. Like, what do we need to do to make this stop? Sympathetic responses activate you into a state of act now. Your body immediately re releases adrenaline. You start to move faster. Your heart rate increases. Your, um, you start to feel tension and cortisol pumps through your blood so that you have, like, you have the energy you need to do something. If you need to run from a tiger, the sympathetic response is going to help you do that. Today, we're, it's usually not lions and tigers and bears that are triggering us, right? It's our boss saying, hey, can I chat with you for a minute? Oh, fast heart rate, increased breathing, tension and tightness everywhere, right? So that is a sympathetic nervous response. Other aspects of a sympathetic nervous response is you start to have racing thoughts, you move into doing mode. What do I need to do right now? Act now, what do I have to do? Um, we often, oftentimes get emotionally overwhelmed. People will get anger, angry and aggressive. You've seen people get in car wrecks and they jump out and it's off to the races, screaming, yelling, who's at fault, who's to blame? Sympathetic nervous response. We feel sensitive, we feel anxious. Sometimes it engages obsessive compulsive behaviors, sometimes addiction, because it's like act now. Is it five o'clock? It's gotta be five o'clock somewhere. There's gotta be some way I can slow down my nervous system, right? We also experience panic attacks, um, impulsivity, overactivity. Sometimes people will engage in people pleasing when they get in that spot because it's act now. Make this stop. What do I have to do to make this stop? We, often, we oftentimes call hyperarousal or a sympathetic nervous response anxiety. Does anybody relate to the concept of hyperarousal or anxiety? Yeah, well, I mean, everybody's hands should be raised because everyone has a sympathetic nerve. Um, on the flip side of that, if your parasympathetic nerve gets activated, it's immediately moving in, us into a place of disconnect and dissociate. I can't be with this. It's too big. It's too overwhelming. Um, I feel massive overwhelm. Sometimes I just shut down. I feel powerless, helpless, shame and guilt oftentimes accompany that. I start to zone out or disconnect. Do, did any of you have that experience when your parents were lecturing you, like as a child or a teen, and you're just like, I'm not listening anymore. I'm going to see you. They're like, can you hear me? What am I saying right now? That's was, was my dad classically. Um, we start to shut down. We shut off and we shut down because our sympathetic, our parasympathetic nerve is communicating to us. Your best chance of getting through this is to shut it down, slow everything down and shut it down. Um, so this creates hypo arousal or what we typically call some kind of freeze response. I don't like calling it a freeze response because I think for a lot of people that experience hypo arousal, they're very aware of what's happening. They just kind of move into the inability to respond. Um, so both of those places, hypo arousal, hypo arousal, not good places to make big decisions from. Right? If I'm super hypo aroused, I shouldn't decide 
where I'm going to college because I'm going to choose something that allows me to sit in my bedroom and never, ever, ever leave, right? If I'm hyper aroused, oh my God, everything's the worst. I got to fix everything. I might quit my job in, you know, a moment of, of, of just complete um, frustration and overwhelm. And it's like, oh, I got to pay my bills. There's a lot of things that are not going to work out about that. Not a good time to make, <laughs> sorry, big decisions. Um, the other thing that's really important in this is that um, while hyperarousal and hypoarousal are really, really, really common trauma responses, they actually exist in all of us. We would not survive if we didn't have the ability to respond with those things. The challenge is the more trauma you're exposed to or chronic stress, which we're going to talk about with epigenetics, the more you'll start to kind of float up into hyperarousal is my baseline. You do not have to raise your hand, but if any of you have chronic anxiety or feel like you have a lot of anxiety, your baseline might have moved up into hyperarousal. And our job as human beings, as a psychotherapist, my job would be to help you get it back into what we call the window of tolerance or optimal functioning. I don't necessarily like what's happening right now, but I can tolerate it. I don't have to pop a pill, shoot some tequila, tell someone, um, I actually use a lot of profanity just in my regular everyday talking. And um, <laughs> I almost just uh, did just now. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should just acknowledge that to the group in case that's why I'll be uncomfortable. So I'll try to keep it at a minimum today. Um, but when we get hyper aroused, we react to things and to people. Raise your hand if you've ever had the experience where you were probably hyper aroused, you reacted, and later, I love that right up there, later felt some guilt, embarrassment, or shame about it. Yeah, that is really common for us. And when we're talking about loaded topics, like intergenerational or historical trauma, there's no way you're not gonna get hyper aroused or hypo aroused today. So you and I, and everybody on the screen, can they see me? Yes. All right, how's it going? And they said you're not creepy. Oh, good, so thank you. I did see some names up there that are probably like, yeah, we'll throw her bone. Um, so we're actually recognizing today in this presentation and throughout the rest of the day, you will absolutely have hyper arousal responses and hypo arousal responses. I bet you anything, some of you have already zoned out and are like, man, right after this, I gotta run to the grocery store and I need to get A, B, C, D, E, because list making and identifying things we have power over helps us get back in our window of tolerance. I do that all the time. I'm like, I don't know what this person's talking about anymore, but when I'm 45, I'm going to Greece. And, the, and then I'm like, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. I don't even know what's happening anymore. I'm so dissociated. I don't care if you do it. I, I mean, if, even if I did, it wouldn't matter. What I care about is that you notice you're doing it and you come back. Dissociation stops being dissociation when we notice it's happened and we come back. That's actually what meditation is. People think meditation is like clearing your mind and getting in a state of Zen. Meditation is training your neural networks to notice I've left in a hyperarousal, freaking out, ugh, or shut down hypoarousal and coming back. You'll train your neural networks over and over again to move. They can move out into freak out. Everyone hates me. My life sucks. Oh, I'm running away into a story. Come back. What do I feel in the room? So I'm going to give you some strategies today for navigating hyper arousal and hypo arousal. But before we jump into the strategies, does anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts about, oh, one other thing I'll say. Most people, when they're in a state of hypoarousal, especially if it becomes a shutdown state, that's what we call depression. So we call hyperarousal, I have a lot of anxiety. We call hypoarousal or a parasympathetic response, 
more depressive tendencies. So when somebody comes in to see me and they're like, I'm just chronically anxious, I have panic attacks. I'm so depressed. I think about suicide all the time. I'm like, we got to get you in your window of tolerance. We got to make this a little bit more manageable for you. And that's what we're going to be doing today. The beauty of working in the window of tolerance is as you practice it, your neural networks will pick it up and take it on themselves. Does that make sense? It's kind of like if you have a favorite hike and you go hiking, you no longer have to think about, and then I turn right and then I go here. You just, you just do it, right? You just go through your hike. That's what we're training our neural networks to do. And honestly, if everybody would, would pick this up and really practice with it over and over again, I would be out of the job because pe people wouldn't need psychotherapy if this became the norm for all of us. All right, so how do we get into the window of tolerance when we're activated? I want you to take a moment to think about something that's bugging you in your life right now. It's really bugging you. You do not like it. Maybe the size of your credit card bill. Maybe that your child's teacher keeps calling you and bothering you about, um, about your child having so much fun, loving energy in class. Um, maybe the holidays bring up enormous amounts of memories for you or you're dreading spending time with family. Maybe you hate your boss. Maybe your boss hates you. I don't know. We're thinking of anything at all that when you think about it, you know <laughs> it activates you. Take like 10 seconds. If, if, if you don't have one, um, congratulations. Um, think about what's happening politically. <laughs> you, you know, get something. Does everybody have something? Okay, everybody on our uh, virtual, everybody has something that's bothering you in your life right now? All right, I don't, on a scale of zero to 10, don't give me a 10. Don't give me the worst trauma of your life. Give me like a four or a five. I really don't like this thing. All right, so I'm gonna have you close your eyes for a minute, or if you don't wanna close your eyes, just gonna stare at something softly. And I want you to blow it up. What is wrong with this thing? What's wrong with everyone involved? Why are they in the wrong? Why does this suck so bad? What should be happening? Ugh, what makes this the worst? And stop. I'm going to have you open your eyes and I want you to just scan your body and notice. Am I having more of a hyperarousal response? My heart rate sped up. I got tight. There's tightness in my belly, in my shoulders, in my chest. Or did I kind of start zoning out? Ugh, I don't care about that thing. It doesn't matter. Okay. So Anybody willing to share what they noticed about themselves? You don't have to share the trigger in case, in case it's about your boss and they're here in the room. Don't share the trigger. Just share what did you notice? What was your awareness of yourself? Stomach. Stomach? Yeah. Like tension or nausea? Um, tension. Okay. <laughs> All right, right here. Same thing, tension all right through my legs and shoulders. Good, limbs. Limbs hold so much of the parasympathetic and sympathetic response. So does the entire core area. Rochelle. A couple people in the chat said they panicked. Another one said my arms start to tingle and I feel panic, fast heart rate. Okay, good, good. Most of what you all just described, thank you, by the way. Most of what you all just described were hyper- arousal responses. So a sympathetic nervous response. Anybody have a parasympathetic where I started kind of, I thought about the thing, but then I drifted away. I stopped thinking about it. Yeah. Would you be willing to share any of that at the back? Uh, uh, yeah. I just kind of went to something else. Distracted. Yep. Good. What's your name? Ashley. Ashley. I might start asking your names because I'm going to go back to that one in just a second, Ashley. And then you raised your hand. Numb out. Okay. Numb out. Good. Exactly right. Both of those are hypo or 
parasympathetic responses. Your bodies did exactly what they're designed to do. The difference is we weren't actually in any danger, right? There was no tiger in the room. None of us were, were headed for a plane crash. We just thought of the thing that feels scary to us or triggering or activating, and it activated our nervous system. In that experience, if we start to baseline out in hyper arousal, if I'm experiencing stomach tension all the time, I might start to see some digestive issues with that, a bunch of other things that we'll talk about in epigenetics. If I start to numb out all the time, or like Ashley said, distract into, I cannot be with that, my neural networks start to tell me I can't be with any distress. And that's where we see big things like addiction come in. I've got to get away from this. I've got to distract. I've got to get away from it. And for little children, that makes sense, right? Five-year-olds that, that don't get picked to play with someone on the playground, that level of rejection is so overwhelming. The right choice is to distract in some way. When you're 43, oh, I'm almost 43. When you're 43, there are things I can be with that I couldn't be with when I was little. So we're practicing this concept of lean in or lean away. So when I get activated, I have two choices in navigating that. And this will switch your neural networks. It's magic, friends. It's literally like magic. It's the beauty of the brain, the human brain. When I get activated, when I'm hyper aroused or hypo aroused, I have two choices. How do I get myself back in the window of tolerance? Giving it too easy, neuroscientists would say you way overshot that, Melinda. But I'm just going to give you some helpful pointers in this. I can lean in to what I'm feeling, or I can lean away and then come back. Both will retrain my neural networks. If I lean in, I'm teaching my neural networks. Actually, I can be with sadness now. I couldn't be with it when I was three. It, it was too overwhelming to my body. Or I can lean away. I got to take the edge off this. It's way too scary. It's way too scary. I just found out my, you know, my sister-in-law has cancer. That's way too big for me. She has little, little kids, way too big for me. I'm going to lean away and then come back to it. So we're intentionally using distraction, Ashley. We're using it on purpose. Here's the big difference with you all work in the violence and, um, and advocacy community, we're consenting to both. Lean in, lean away. So here are some options for that. You ready? Lean in. I want you to go back to the thing that's bothering you or something else. Go to something else. It's a holidays, lots of bothering things. Lots of upsetting things. Go to something that's bothering you. Could be the same thing. I want you to blow it up again for 10 seconds. Make it as big as it gets. Why is this so awful? If it's the same thing, it'll be, it'll be less bad this time. Ready, go. <clears throat> and stop. If you feel like you can lean in, let's try that first. I want you to identify where you feel tension in your body. Where is the tension? And we're actually gonna lean into it, make it bigger. So for five seconds, we're gonna tighten everything in your body. Do it with me, okay? Here we go. Five seconds, we're gonna tighten everything like you're having a baby. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop, shake it out a little bit. Come on, do this with me. We're doing this again. Shake it out, shake it out. Stop. What do you notice in your body now? I don't, I assume it's still there. I'm certain it's still there. My hope is it might have shifted a little bit. Okay, everybody on the, on the um, screen, we're going to do it together, okay? Once again, tighten everything as tight as you can get it in your body. We're leaning into that stomach tension. Here we go. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Shake it out. Okay, 
What are you noticing now? Any changes? Any differences? Um, I mean, I can't wait to read out the chat. Yeah. Uh, tingling becomes less. Anything else? Good, that's right. It changes your physiological experience. Doesn't mean it always gets better. You're leaning into it and it teaches your neural networks, oh, I can think about my work conflict and be okay. I can do that. It doesn't mean I'm taking it from a seven to a zero. I'm taking it from a seven to a four. My neural networks are engaging with that and taking it on. This is going to be important when we talk about epigenetics. So that's one example of leaning in. Anybody familiar with self-compassion training? Kristen Neff and Chris Germer's work. Um, it's really important to me to name though that, that this particular approach to self-compassion work has existed in indigenous communities and um, and uh, native traditions for a really long time. But Kristen Neff and, and Chris Germer are excellent translators into a very Western world. Um, Self-compassion training is this idea that we're training our neural networks to go to a place of self-compassion. So this is one other lean-in tool. I want you to think about something in your life that's been hard for you. Not necessarily a trigger, but something that's hard. Maybe my child's struggling in school. Maybe my parents are dying. Something that's been hard for you. Everybody got something? Anybody else? Everybody got something? All right. We're going to practice three things in this, and it's training. And I have you see the version of you that's really struggling with this thing. And we are going to acknowledge to that person, this is really hard. This sucks. This is bullshit. I hate this. It's so painful. This is causing suffering. It's really hard for me. Next, we're going to normalize everybody struggles all human beings believe they're not enough sometimes this feels really lonely but i'm not alone in this all human beings suffer and last step in self-compassion training what do you need it's okay i see you it's okay <coughs> Do you need a Diet Coke? Do you need to get up and go to the bathroom? What do you need in here? Again, we're switching up neural network movement in that dynamic. Those are both lean-in strategies. Sometimes what's triggering us is way too big. We cannot lean into it. We need to lean away. Ashley gave the example earlier. And then right here, what is your name with the beige sweater? What is it? Beatrice. Beatrice. Oh, I like that name. Beatrice gave us the example of kind of numbing out. Sometimes things are too big for us. And instinctually, our brain is saying, you can't be with this all right now. Distract, distract, distract. Lean into that wisdom. Distract. Just choose to do it, which is different than dissociating. So choose to distract. So I gave you a lifesaver. Or those of you that are on the virtual world, I asked you to find an item. It could be a glass of water. It could be a key. It could be anything at all. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Anything at all. Man, I'm off on our timing today, but we'll, we'll catch up. We'll catch up. So you've got your item. Everybody, anybody got a lifesaver? All right. I want you to take your item and we're going to engage your senses in it. So feel it in your hands. Feel it in your hands, notice what you feel. Is it hard? If you have a lifesaver, can you feel the side with the letters versus the side with no letters? What do you see about your item? What colors are there? Is there a bottom? Is there a top? What do you see? 
Put it up to your ear. What do you hear? And then I'm gonna have you smell it. And if you can't smell it, if the item doesn't smell, find something that does smell and switch back and forth. No smell, smell. Last of all, what does your item taste like? If that's not accessible, that's okay. Identify something about your item you like. So for me, my item tastes like water. It's good water too. Um, my item tastes like water. All right, put it down. And I want you to go back to the thing that's bothering you. Does it feel any more possible to be present with it? If I've leaned away and come back. People always say, like when I've done couples therapy, people are like, well, we never go to bed angry. I'm like, oh, that was bad advice. Go to bed angry because you're gonna lean away from the enormity of that emotional experience. And when you wake up, it will feel different. Sometimes it feels worse, sometimes it feels better, but it will feel different. We're getting your neural networks different experiences. So we're gonna switch to your small groups really quickly. And you're gonna chat about what that experience was like for you. So those of you that are moving into small groups virtually, you're just answering these questions. What did you notice in your own body during our window of tolerance activities? How do you experience hyperarousal and hypoarousal? What do you need to get into your own window of tolerance when you're hyper or hypoaroused? And how can you apply this today during our work? Because we're going to talk about generational trauma. There'll be some triggers. Um, all right. So those of you that are at a table, um, go ahead and either you can work with a partner. That's probably the easiest. How how what do you have them split up into? I am um, probably about four or five, depending on if. Okay. You so just do your table then. You're just answering these questions broadly. And again, no one ever has to answer, but I would love for you to just raise your awareness about some of this. So let's take five minutes with this. Ready, go. Yeah.
Okay, we're going to bring it back together. Can they hear me now? They have three more seconds. Okay. So give me a Did anybody have any major insights into themselves or maybe not major insight? We were just reminded of something. Anything at all? Yeah. I really suck. Mm. What? Yeah. What's your name? Alex. Okay. Alex said, Alex, I've met you before. Yeah. Yeah. Alex said, I suck at being in my body. Um, I, I want to use a, a different phrase in that, um, obviously, because, you know, I make a little bit positive spin on that. But being in our bodies is hard when we have spent a lot of our time in our heads. And that's part of what we're learning. I'm teaching my neural networks to be aware of my body because just in that awareness of what's happening in my body, I'm closer to my window of tolerance. So like you said, can you tell me your name? Vanessa, Vanessa said earlier, my stomach's all like tight and right there to switch to that awareness. I'm closer to my window of tolerance. I'm making this more tolerable in my body and my psyche. Body awareness is really important. So often I work with clients and especially men. I think we socialize men to stay out of their bodies a lot of the time. But I will work with men that are like, I can't, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I can't feel anything. And so we'll practice things like put your hands together. Can you feel your right hand up against your left hand. Now I want you to switch. To feel your left hand up against your right hand. Stop. What do you feel now? There's tingling in the top. I can feel movement. We're learning how to feel our bodies. And every single time we're doing that, we're getting closer to our window of tolerance. So Alex, you don't suck at being in your body. You win a prize today. You get an extra lifesaver because you had awareness. It's hard for me to feel in my body. The awareness is a win right there because you just paused and your neural networks are rerouting that. Does that make sense? Anybody on the chat, big revelations or awareness or thoughts? And also anyone in the room too. Now that I know Vanessa and Ashley, Beatrice, um, Alex, Danielle, now that I know some of your names, I'm calling on you. <laughs> Anything from the chat? No, sorry. I'm okay. Trying to help you mess up our breakout rooms a little bit. So. Oh, no worries. I, we're going to keep reflecting on the window of tolerance because navigating the nervous system is intimately tied with epigenetics. So transitioning to epigenetics. I'm not gonna ask the question, does anybody know what epigenetics is? Because then we're gonna spend 45 minutes talking about it and that's just like loaded, right? Nobody wants to answer. What comes up for you when you think about epigenetics? What do you associate it with? I would take things as much as like, I hear the word epigenetics and I think of EpiPens. <laughs> Or I hear the word epigenetics and I'm like, what is that craziness? Or I think of this, or I think of that. What do you associate epigenetics to? What comes up for you? Environment. Okay. Genes. Environment, genes. All right, well Brain you, cells. yeah. Brain okay. Anything else? Wire together, fire together. Wire together, fire together. Okay, neuron. Yeah, you guys are pulling in all this stuff that is interrelated. Good. Anything else? All right. Well, here's the thing about epigenetics. People research epigenetics 
um, you know, people will spend 10, 12, 16 years of their lives studying epigenetics by observing rats and mice um, and monkeys and all sorts of other things. And we are going to talk today about what we know about epigenetics and more importantly, what we don't know from epigenetics. One of the things that feels really important for me to name is that most of the information we have gotten regarding humans and epigenetics has come from three really distinct bodies of people. Um, Holocaust survivors, indigenous or native communities, and um, the ancestors of enslaved people. Um, I don't actually, as, a, a, like, as an individual, I don't relate to or have family um, that lives in any of those categories. And yet the research that's come from these communities has been invaluable. So I wanna be able to name that. I'm gonna name it several times as we go today, but we're also gonna hear from three guest speakers that represent those three communities. So we're gonna hear, um, we're gonna start by listening to um, a woman named Tess Lessman um, based out of the University of Michigan. She um, has a PhD in social work, but she has focused her, all of her work on um, studying the impact of epigenetics on maternal fetal medicine. Um, we're gonna, she's gonna give us a brief overview of epigenetics. We're gonna hear from um, a, a Chippewa woman from Canada, who's gonna give us an overview of um, historical trauma in indigenous communities and what work is being done um, to heal in that. We're gonna hear from another woman, um, Carolyn, who I forget her name. Um, she is a pediatrician, uh, African-American woman that's gonna talk a little bit about historical trauma and the work she does and how it's impacted her personal experience. And then at the end, we're gonna hear from a, um, a Holocaust survivor based out of Slovakia that's gonna talk to us a little bit about, um, and he's an epigeneticist too, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about what this means for our work. So as providers, what does that mean? All right. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview. We're going to start with Tess Lessman, who is going to talk to us about what is epigenetics. Um, and she's funny because when she recorded this, she's written several articles. I'm going to send you a list of resources if you're more interested in this stuff. She's written several articles, but she's she gets a little spastic in like talking about being out of her own window. And um, she's, she's really good at kind of naming what's happening for her in the moment. Um, okay. Why is this not moving? Oh, here it is. Hello all, thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be with you. I love talking about this subject. So I'm excited to give an overview of epigenetics. To all is it loud time. enough? Um, so just to go over some of what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna give an overview of epigenetics, um, the human stress response, and then give some examples and outcomes and ways in which we as professionals, um, why this information is useful to us. <coughs> so um, basically epigenetics is a new understanding of how the environment and genetics work together. Um, a lot of the helping professions have always talked about the interaction between nature and nurture, um, but it's sort of been this mushy, magical thing that happens, and we haven't understood the, the real um, underlying thing that happens, which is epigenetics. So we know that development is genetically programmed, but that it unfolds in interaction with the environment. Um, the way really we discovered about epigenetics was through the Human Genome Project. This was a big scientific research project that began in 1990. Um, and the goal was just to map out the entire human genome, hope, hoping that we could identify which gene caused which disease. And this would really help us to cure all of the various diseases that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, but in actuality, is what it was what we did not learn from the project that was most overwhelming. And that was the fact that these diseases occurred even without um, an understanding of each individual gene. 
So we know that most diseases result from an interaction of multiple genes and that behaviors are related to, are not related to specific genes, but again, these interactions between them and even simple characteristics such as eye color are not usually related to a single gene, but an interaction between genes. This, um, and one of the ways that we could, that this is most easily explained is through identical twins. Um, identical twins have the exact same DNA. They're born with the exact same DNA. And yet as they grow older, they continue to look different. Um, I have an example in my own personal life of uh, twin uncles that are identical twins. And if you look at pictures of them growing up, they were dressed the same, they looked the exact same um, through almost through high school and they were engaged in the same activities. They, you know, they ate the same foods. They were, their DNA remained the same because they were in that environment and it, it continued to make them look the same. However, as they grew older, one of them is, is a, a working professional in Minnesota. The other one is a farmer in New Mexico. And now you would not, if you saw them together now, you would never know that they were identical twins. And it's because the environment has affected their genes in a way that makes them appear different. Um, identical twins uh, who have the same BRCA gene mutation don't necessarily get cancer. Um, identical twins who have, one might have a serious mental disorder while the other one does not, even though they have the exact same genes. The way we can explain this is through um, epigenetics and the way our environment affects the genes. And we're gonna go through this a little bit more details, but just introducing the topic here. Um, so really, if you think about it, or the way that I like to think about it and spin it in a positive light is that every child is born to be a genius um, but whether the genes get turned on or off is based on the environment. So it's the environment that a child grows up in that really determines their, their, um, their future. Um, so another, another thing that for with us as helping professionals, um, we know that CBT is an effective therapeutic intervention. And we know that it is effective or the way that it is effective is because it creates new neural pathways within the brain that is in response to genes being turned on and off through the environment. So through the, the therapeutic intervention of CBT itself. Um, DNA plasticity is a way that our species has survived over time. Um, it's nature has provided this mechanism for DNA to change in response to the environment so that there are um, populations that can live on the polar ice cap and there are populations that can live in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's the, the way that the environment codes for specific genes that affect <laughs> even things like skin color and amount of body fat. Um, all of those things happen in response to the environment and it's because of this DNA plasticity. Um, so I know these are some really broad overarching things, but I'm gonna get into more specifics here. Um, the actual mechanism through which epigenetics happens is through um, what's called methylation. So the picture that you're looking at on your screen right here is um, a picture of a, of a strand of DNA. Um, and those rungs on the ladder are, um, are where you will find the genes and their proteins. Proteins code for certain um, things that then are expressed. So for example, um, there we have a gene known as a tumor suppressor gene. So the tumor suppressor gene codes for tumor suppressor cells. So we want these tumor suppressor cells um, in our body because they fight invading cancer cells. So we have, um, we have cancer that comes into our body, but we have these tumor suppressor cells that then are able to attack that cancer and fight that cancer so that cancer and tumors don't grow freely within our body. However, if we toxins in the environment can create these methyl groups, um, which would, will then affix themselves to the, um, the gene, the tumor suppressor gene, which will then make it so that tumor suppressor cells don't flow freely throughout our body and we're not able to fight off that cancer. So for example, um, smoking is a toxic chemical that, opt that some ingest into their body. Um, and this, these chemicals can then create a methyl group which will fix themselves 
to the tumor suppressor gene, which means that it codes for less of those tumor suppressor cells. So those cells are not in our body um, and not fighting off the cancer cells that are created through those toxins. Um, and so tumors will grow more freely. So it's, this is like one of the direct links between um, cancer and toxins in the environment. So smoking, for example. Um, so toxins in the environment create those methyl groups that then affix themselves to certain genes and then will silence those genes. Um, toxins in the environment, smoking, for example, smoke, chemicals in the environment, pollution, um, things that we eat, uh, preservatives, a lot of these things will then can create these methyl groups that will, um, that will silence genes. So um, some of these are, are, um, are more toxic, um, but what I like to, to talk about specifically are vulnerable populations. So you think about low-income neighborhoods, particularly minority populations. Oftentimes, they are closer to factories and landfills, which so people are ingesting more of these toxic chemicals, which then will create methyl groups and silence certain genes. Um, they're more prone to hazardous infrastructure. So Flint, Michigan being um, a prime example of this. So toxic chemicals within um, drinking water and pipes, the poor food quality choices. One of the things that actually um, can, can demethylate genes is, are things like folate, so leafy green vegetables. Um, and love and nurture. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more of specifics about that in a minute. But the fact that in these, these vulnerable populations in low income neighborhoods have poor food quality choices, there's more fast food in these low income neighborhoods, there's fewer grocery stores, and even within those grocery stores, there's less produce. So less access to um, green leafy vegetables and folate, which would demethylate um, <laughs> some of these, these genes that are silenced because of that. Um, so, like I said, love and lifestyle are critical, um, and love and nurture and extreme um, bonding can actually can demethylate genes. It can also build more stress receptors. We're going to get into stress in just a minute, um, and and that will help combat the effects of of these um, these genes being silenced. However, if you think about vulnerable populations and the fact that they don't have access to healthy foods, they may not be in environments where you can get proper exercise and just run around and play as children. Um, if you're working multiple jobs, you may not be able to attend to children and really love and nurture them the way that, that is needed. And, um, and so that's, that's not possible for some of the most vulnerable populations. I'm going to go ahead and stop here before I'm, I want to, I'm going to be talking about the human stress response system and how that relates to epigenetics. And actually, I'm going to be talking about the human stress response. Um, did anybody hear anything in that that was new, surprising? You kind of knew some of those things? All right. We're going to talk a little bit about, because it feels like kind of a bummer information, right? I'm just going to recap what you went over really quickly. Epigenetics is the study of how the events that happen to you, such as traumatic events and trauma responses, can turn on or off certain genes in your DNA. All of us have cancer cells that run through our bodies. We get exposed to it all the time. However, we also have, through a process called methylation, we also have tumor suppressor genes. So when we have had lots of exposure to love, to oxytocin, to a good interchange between oxytocin and cortisol, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how, how we get that. Folic acid, anyone in here ever um, have a pregnancy and you were taking folic acid? Oh, Tally's in the back. Tally and I were pregnant together. We took folic acid together, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so fun. We facilitated a group. What was that, like 14 years ago? Gosh. Yeah. All right. Well, folic acid helps combat or strengthen, or in epigenetics language, it puts a mark on the gene that either activates it or does not activate it. 
Methylate activates, demethylate deactivates. So everybody in here, you were born with your DNA intact. There's nothing you can do to change the DNA you were born with, nothing. However, epigenetics, it, the way I like to think about it is epigenetics translates your DNA, almost like um, depending on, okay, let's say, so I'm presenting in English and I am I am not an ASL expert. We have some over here, right? Depending on, I don't know if this is the best example, but depending on the interpreter, the message could get changed, right? I mean, we see that happen all the time, all the time in politics. We'll see um, uh, English um, uh, speeches or French speeches being translated into the country's native language and certain aspects of the message get changed via the translation. I like to think of epigenetics that way. Methylation itself, well, how do we get this information? From the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project tracked all of this information about genes and was like, why does this twin and this twin both have the brachia gene or um, breast cancer gene? One of them got breast cancer, one did not. That's what we're trying to understand, what happened? And what we know is it's the methylation and the demethylation process that impacts that. Or what I think it was Ashley said earlier, um, the environment. How did the environment impact whether or not the gene got activated? And that's actually what we do have influence over. And we're gonna talk really specifically about how advocates have influence over that in just a little bit. And the pointers I'm gonna give you, they're not hard. They're not hard things. Can you control if the clients you work with or the, the population that you serve takes folic acid, eats leafy green vegetables, exercises? Absolutely not. So we gotta come in through a different window. I mean, we can encourage it, but we gotta come in through a different door. So methylation marks the gene based on experience. Demethylation demarks and can deactivate it. Um, <clears throat> sorry, stress responses and disease. So stress response, we already went over with our polyvagal theory. Um, Rochelle, where are we at time-wise? It's 9.48. 9.48, two more minutes and you're going to break. Um, the stress response is really important in that. So the way your sympathetic or parasympathetic nerves engage in your body is really important. If I'm living at a baseline of hyper arousal, I am thinning the protective genes that protect me from getting cancer, from getting diabetes. Does that make sense? It's why we talk about stress so much. And people are like, there's nothing I can do about my stress, but there is. And it doesn't mean a self-care day. There are lots of things we can do to increase how we're taking care of our stress response. Part of that is getting in our window of tolerance. So earlier when I talked to you about this and people were like, oh, I'm so sick of this bullshit. We talk about the window of tolerance all the time. I'm actually trying to help you not get cancer and not get diabetes and not get Parkinson's disease. Um, so we really are navigating the whole entire system by understanding epigenetics. Um, so stress responses, if I'm chronically hyper aroused or chronically hypo aroused, it's taxing the genes and putting a methylation mark on my DNA. So hopefully I don't have the brachia gene um, I don't actually know. My grandmother had breast cancer, but hopefully I don't have the brachia gene. But even if I do, and I'm not Angelina Jolie, I can't, I can't pay to have a double mastectomy and a reconstruction and completely shift my methylization process in that way. I mean, good for her that she could do that, but most of us can't. What are my other options? How do I strengthen my stress responses. Um, and then lastly, we can't change DNA. We can influence how it's interpreted. 
and whether or not specific genes get activated. Isn't that exciting, right? This is so exciting. Like we can figure out how to influence the way our genes get interpreted or activated or not activated. We can't pinpoint that down to real specifics, but we, can, we know some overall things that drastically make a difference. All right, 10 minute break. Think on the hopefulness of all of that, and I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I talked to a couple of you during the break, um, and it sounds like some of this is, um, at the very least, just like interesting in terms of like outcomes for ourselves and the people we love and care about. And that's actually what I was hoping for. Um, it's really funny. I joke all the time with people. I, I don't trust therapists that are not in therapy. I'm like, you have to have a, a version of like doing this intensity yourself. And I think when we get to a pretty grounded place of like, here's the truth. Like I love sugar and I, and I don't love like fancy sugar. I'm like little kid sugar. I'm like all the Sour Patch Kids, all the, all the things. And like, I can eat it in a really dissociative way. I'm going to like sit down and plow through this. And sugar actually has a fairly negative impact on gene sequencing. However, I also drink a lot of water and I also try to exercise, even if it's just walking. And we're looking at these things through this framework of, we're not actually ever going to get everyone all the things that contribute to the translation of and protection of, of genes, of genetics. But being able to focus on it to some extent is wildly different than having absolutely no awareness of it or focus on it. Does that make sense? It's very much a harm reduction approach because some of these things will just, you will have solid tumor suppressor genes on your own and some people don't. And that's what we're looking at. We're, we're looking at epigenetics through this lens. All right, we're gonna talk really quickly about the, hu oh, before I go any further, any comments or thoughts or questions, anything so far that you're like, oh man, I'm thinking about that or I hated this or I wildly disagree with this or I love that. And we'll take it off, anything. Or in the chat. Yeah, Alex. I think in general, it's fascinating. Yeah, cool. Alex, um, for those of you in the chat, Alex said it's fascinating and makes her want to learn more. And I'm actually, I'm going to give you some resources um, that you can get a big chunk of information in this video or going to this website or um, this book by Mark Wolin. Um, called It Didn't Start With You. Have any of you read this or seen it? Okay, so some of you know a lot of this already, but this is a great, really accessible book. I also think I'm gonna point you to um, a Canadian indigenous group that has done a series of workshops that are actually really short. So like I, sometimes in the morning, I'll be, if I'll be getting ready. Um, and I'll be getting ready and I'll listen to it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never thought about that. And so I'll try to like sneak this thing into my parenting or sneak this thing in here. And it, I don't have a PhD in epigenetics, but I'm just getting like little things over and over again that I use in my therapy practice a lot too. Thanks, Alex. Um, anybody else? Yeah. I just wanted to point out how I'm hopeful for this next week's be able, right? I think I learned a little bit about the, the gene what do you call it, where it, it doesn't morph it, but it will re read it differently. Oh yeah, methylation. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, in positive psychology. Yeah. Uh, but to think that your bodies, like you can't treat your body right, or your best up, right? Yeah. Your bodies are, are hard, um, that you can change it, and you can change it for your future. Yeah. So you kid as well. Yep. And what's your name? Michelle. Michelle. The thing I love so much about what Michelle just said, like that there's hopefulness in this, is that it actually, the more little things of these that we incorporate in, the more we're shifting our own environment and the way our posterity will experience some of these things as well. And that goes for even if you um, 
don't have children, like your engagement with the environment and people around you, which we're going to talk about as advocates in just a minute. Um, I wanted to name just the human stress response. It's our fight or flight response. It's polyvagal theory. Um, it's the emergency reaction system of the body. It is there to keep you safe in emergencies. When the stress response is turned on, your body releases adrenaline and cortisol. What, what is that called? High per arousal, hyper arousal. It's that activation, like speed up of the heartbeat, act now. What's allowing us to act now is um, adrenaline and cortisol. Um, your organs are programmed to respond in certain ways to situations that are viewed as challenging or threatening. You, you probably have all like been exposed to the research between um, people that accidentally will fall into a frozen lake and be hospitalized with hypothermia versus people who intentionally jump into a frozen lake, like the polar bear plunge, et cetera, they're gearing up for it with oxytocin and cortisol and adrenaline. And there's a different biological response. Those are the kinds of things we're looking at in this process. Any comments or thoughts from our chat, from our uh, virtual folks? Give us a second just in case the time. Yeah, no worries. Okay, if you have any, just throw them out there. All right, she talked about tumor suppressors. Anybody take anything away from that idea, tumor suppressors? We're, we're all, we all actually, this is so wild to me, we all actually have cancer cells that move through our bodies, everybody does. And, and the more, you know, our, our um, industrialized world has become more industrialized, we have more cancer cells moving through our bodies. We also all have tumor suppressor genes. So our DNA is programmed to fight things that don't belong in the body. In fact, this is funny, um, Tess Lessman's research is on maternal fetal medicine. And she said, the reason that women get so sick um, in the beginning of pregnancy, will often think they have a cold or, or headaches or before they find out they're pregnant, the tumor suppressor genes are saying, whoa, wait, what is happening in the body? And they're trying to fight the impact of the developing fetus until the hormones then indoctrinate the bloodstream and the hormones start to create a nesting environment for the fetus. Does that make sense? So it's like our genes are wired to say, uh, you're going to be a threat to me and then to push back against it. Um, Wait, there's good laughter. Anything, anything to share with the group? No, actually, I was just saying that when I was pregnant, obviously my body failed to recognize that because I thought it was a whole night. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Your tumor suppressor genes are solid. Yeah, that's good. And you have a strong immune system. So nice work. Um, so there's actually a really lovely example of how this experience gets programmed in utero. Has anyone heard of the Dutch winter? Um, there, I have two really profound examples of this, but Dutch winter was um, during World War II when the Nazis had invaded, um, had, had come further um, west and um, the Netherlands, um, Amsterdam, that it, entire area became Nazi occupied. Um, there was a, there was the main road to get into the Netherlands was blocked off um, by the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. And so food, because the Dutch don't actually uh, prepare or grow that much of their own food. So food started getting blocked from coming in and out. So there were, um, this research project came to be, I'll tell you why at the end, I don't want to give it away. But um, there started to be this recognition of like, we may need to starve, like we're not getting access to food. So that information was getting communicated to, from pregnant women to their developing fetus. Was that you need to learn how to 
exist on low amounts of calories. They came out with really low birth weights. We see this um, in lots of traumatic pregnancies, really low birth weight. Uh, we see it with fetal alcohol syndrome and we also see it with uh, toxic stress during pregnancy. So babies will be born with very low birth weights and within about 12 to 13 years, we saw many of these children experiencing obesity. Why do you think that was? What about their, their um, methylation process during pregnancy could have contributed to that? They, their, their methylation or their gene sequencing taught them to survive, to only need really low amounts of calories. When they came out, um, out of the womb, and then there was access to additional food, they were eating the same amount of calories, they were storing it more as a stress response. None of that's cognitive, right? None of that is thought. And it's interesting, the better, the more familiar we've gotten with obesity, the better we are seeing that obesity is not necessarily related to caloric consumption. It's oftentimes related to what type of, of genetic sequencing I received, especially in utero. In a minute, I'm gonna ask you, you're gonna meet as little groups and you're gonna talk about what you know about your families and especially what you know about your mom's pregnancy um, because those are important things for us to discover. All right, uh, what else? Oh yeah, I have a, a client um, story. Um, my client uh, was, her, her mom got pregnant with her in 1950. Um, 1950, got pregnant with her, and she was 17 years old, got kicked out of her home, and uh, lived in, they didn't have a homeless shelter at the time, it was a, um, gosh, what was it, like a, a Salvation Army, or something like that, and she lived there throughout her whole pregnancy. She had, um, she smoked and drank throughout her pregnancy, and she also had really low access to nutrition. She was planning to place the baby um, for adoption. And then when the baby was born, decided to keep her. Um, there's a lot of genetic, or I mean, a lot of environmental factors in this, but my client was raised extremely, extremely low birth weight, like four and a half pounds. And um, as a small child developing, she, had, she always had low birth weight. Um, and then as she like aged into having more resources, started to navigate issues with obesity. And when we've talked about her earliest experiences with nurturing, um, nurturing is what creates oxytocin and repairs. It creates demethylation. It repairs genes that help with this. Um, she has zero, no memory whatsoever of ever being touched by her mother. And as we've like kind of gone through kind of this really distressing relationship where my client very much cared to her mother who was, you know, a 17 year old mom. Um, she has a lot of awareness of this absolute terror of being touched, of being held, of being loved. She craves it. She's physiologically wired to crave it, right? And it's so terrifying and has had lots of other health impacts. So really interesting information. Her and I have been working together for a while, so I'll talk about her again in a minute um, throughout our work together. Uh, again, thoughts, comments, curious, right? Okay, although the science of epigenetics is still in its infancy, really it solidly kind of hit the forefront with the Human Genome Project, which was early 90s. Um, but the epigenetics is still in its infancy. The research and studies emerging in this field have far-reaching implications for how we think and talk about the impact of generational trauma. And this came from Judy Bluehorse Skelton, who's a professor of education at Portland State University and also a member of the indigenous community there in Portland. And um, 
there's a group I'm about to talk to you about that's done a lot of research on how this has, has shown up in generational trauma. So we're going to shift gears just a little Hello. bit. Oops. Hi, my name is Jasmine. We're going to shift gears into generational trauma. So before we jump into this video, this woman's going to introduce us to um, generational trauma through the indigenous experience. Um, does anybody want to start us off by throwing out just the idea of what epigenetics and generational trauma are connected, but they're not the same thing? Any thoughts on that connection and also why they're not the same thing? All right, we'll just be thinking about it as we jump into the sec second portion of our training. Is there anything? Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Jasmine Peterson from Sullivan and Associates Clinical Psychology. Today, I'd like to introduce you to our webinar series <laughs> on Indigenous mental health. For our first topic, we're going to be talking about intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma has become something of a buzzword. We've all heard it, but what exactly does it mean? Well, some of us instinctively know what it means because we have lived it. For those it affects personally, there are probably some specific images, family histories, and feelings that arise when you hear this word. Scientifically though, and specifically within the field of psychology, the term has a very specific meaning. It refers to the process by which trauma can be transmitted from one generation to the next through a variety of mechanisms. Some of the main ways in which trauma is passed from one generation to the next. Oh, oh my gosh. Buju. Hi. My name is Jasmine Peterson from Sullivan and Associates Clinical. It increases cortisol, the stress hormone in our brains and bodies, and can lead to heightened stress responses to future stressors or traumas. Basically, that exposure to intense, repeated, and ongoing trauma makes a person and their offspring more sensitive to future traumas. Environmentally, once a person has experienced a trauma, it can change how they interact with the world and those around them. Trauma very commonly causes an individual to disconnect emotionally and socially, which transmits emotion disconnection to future generations as well. And sometimes those traumas cause us to act out our traumas on others. For example, a child who is physically abused may not have learned appropriate ways of responding to stress and as an adult might know no other ways of responding and therefore enact physical abuse on their own children. In this way, it gets passed down through the generations. Socially, through ongoing cultural trauma. When the conditions that led to the trauma do not change significantly, that maintains and further traumatizes. An example of this is poverty. When this country was established, it afforded resources to the settlers while impoverishing indigenous populations. Even as wealth has grown over the centuries, indigenous people are still more likely to live in poverty and therefore struggle with wealth inequality. Thus, intergenerational trauma is passed down because the circumstances that created it have not ceased. So where did all this trauma come from? Indigenous peoples in Canada have experienced numerous traumas from the time of colonial contact. Colonization refers to large-scale population movements in which the migrants maintain strong connections with their or their ancestors' former country, gaining significant advantages over other inhabitants of the territory by such links. When colonization takes place under the protection of clearly colonial political structures, it may most handily be called settler colonialism. This often involves the settlers entirely dispossessing earlier inhabitants or instituting legal and other structures which systematically disadvantage them. This is what happened on Turtle Island with contact and the consequent influx of immigrants following 1492. This was the beginning of current experiences of intergenerational trauma. Colonial events in Canadian history include, but are not limited to, the pass system, residential school system, the 60s scoop, and missing murdered Indigenous girls, women, boys, and men. Let's take a closer look at each of these. The pass system was established in 1885 
enforced into the 1940s and was not repealed until 1951. It required Indigenous persons to acquire a pass to leave their reservations for purposes of trade, visiting family in other reservations, traveling to cities to acquire goods, and so on. The effects of the pass system include limited ability to participate in trade. Often, the time it took to acquire a pass would cause goods to be traded to be spoiled. This was one way in which income disparities were maintained as settlers were able to move freely about, trading their goods without impediment and reaching the market before members of First Nations communities. It restricted movement between communities. This limited participation in important cultural traditions and ceremonies. It was one way in which the government effectively shut down potlatch, Sundance ceremonies, and so on. It restricted parents from visiting their children at residential schools. One of Canada's most egregious acts of colonization, and one that has contributed most significantly to intergenerational trauma in Indigenous populations across the country, in today was the residential school system. These are histories that many of you are probably very familiar with, having attended them yourselves, as the last residential school did not close until 1996, or having heard some of the histories passed down from your parents, grandparents, or even your great-grandparents. So what were they? A network of boarding schools for Indigenous children funded by the Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and administered by Christian churches. The stated objective was to kill the Indian and the child. This was a means of assimilating Indigenous peoples into settler culture, and by 1884, attendance was compulsory, with RCMP members arriving into communities and taking children away to those schools when parents would not comply. These schools were located vast differences from children's home and communities and families. This was a deliberate strategy argued for by Indian Commissioner Hayter Reed in order to minimize contact between families and their children, as he thought that interactions with their parents and families counteracted the school's efforts to civilize Indigenous children. For most, residential school was unpleasant, traumatic, and even harmful. Many instances of abuse were reported from students in residential schools, including physical, emotional, and sexual abuse by teachers as well as by other students. These experiences left many of the survivors of these schools traumatized and with disrupted attachment, which affected their ability to connect with their families when they did return home. This disrupted attachment also led to ongoing and intergenerational issues when these students grew up and had families of their own that they struggled to connect with due to their own experiences of trauma. It is estimated that approximately 150,000 Indigenous children attended residential schools. In terms of intergenerational impact, that means that at least that many families were potentially exposed to trauma. Trauma that might have been transmitted to their children grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on. Now, I'm not good at math, but when you think of the extent of these effects and how multiple people within one family can carry on the trauma, even genetically, that is a profound and sobering consideration. An estimated 6,000 children died at residential schools due to the conditions, the abuse, or while attempting escape. However, records are incomplete, so we cannot know for sure how many children never returned home. At many schools, students were used as research subjects. Nutritional experiments were carried out at different schools, typically involved essentially starving the student and supplementing with vitamins to determine the effects of starvation on the body and its ability to be reversed. These children suffered significantly in terms of developmentally and their health due to these experiments, and many died from the effects of starvation. Additionally, in some of these studies, dental care was denied to the children in order to observe the effects of malnutrition on dental health. Current health concerns like diabetes, obesity, and reproductive health effects are linked to the malnutrition experienced in residential school experiments. Intergenerational trauma is not merely socially passed along, but can also be encoded genetically. Similarly, a vaccine for tuberculosis was tested on Indigenous peoples. They had attempted to test the vaccine on children in a Quebec city, but found follow-up too difficult. And because of the PASS system, limiting movement, they began testing vaccine effectiveness on infants and children in reservations. During the 60s, there was an active campaign to adopt Indigenous children. 
Effects of removing children from their homes and their communities included disruption of families and disordered attachments. Adults who were apprehended and adopted during the 60s scoop may have experienced significant and long-lasting effects. For example, the disruption in secure attachment may lead to difficulty trusting or feeling close to others as an adult. This gets transmitted to future generations environmentally. Many people who have had family members that were adopted during this time can identify that disconnect, having a parent who struggled to communicate, who could not show their feelings or affection, who are sometimes cold or distant with them. The homes that Indigenous children were sent to were not always pleasant. Once adopted, sometimes children experienced abuse or neglect in those homes. These types of experiences can have very negative effects on a person's worldview or self-concept, thereby affecting their life in all aspects. It has adverse effects on parenting because children were taken from their families and placed in the homes of settlers. There was a disconnect between parenting styles and how children had previously experienced parental connections and relationships. This resulted in loss of cultural knowledge and Indigenous parenting skills. This has had ongoing effects in communities where families of those who were adopted out through the 60s scoop have had a hard time with parenting their own children, creating more intergenerational trauma and parenting effects. The system itself now often holds prejudicial attitudes toward Indigenous parenting and continues to see poverty experienced in communities as a symptom of neglect rather than of government policies that have failed Indigenous peoples. These effects continue the disproportionate involvement of child welfare systems in Indigenous communities. There are currently more children in care than there were children in residential schools. Mental health issues. So in addition to disrupted attachment, many of the now adults who had been removed from their families experienced significant mental health concerns, including things like depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and interpersonal difficulties. These same mental health issues can be transferred both genetically and environmentally to future generations. In First Nations families and communities, it is very common for most people to have been affected in some way by the issue of missing murdered Indigenous women, girls, men, and boys. Even if it's not a direct relative or friend, most people are connected in some way to a person who has gone missing or was murdered. A 2011 Statistics Canada report estimated that from 1997 to 2000, the rate of homicide for Aboriginal women was almost seven times higher than other females. Indigenous women and girls are disproportionately affected by all forms of violence, including sexual violence, physical violence, stalking, harassing, and so on. There are a number of ways that intergenerational trauma is expressed in consequent generations. Some of the effects of historical and ongoing traumas on Indigenous people include violence within families, chronic or episodic family violence, physical, sexual, emotional, and or verbal. When children were taken from their families and raised in abusive environments, it disrupted normal and natural development, changing how their brains responded to things like stress, sadness, and even positive emotions like love and affection. This has had ongoing effects within individuals and their families. Difficulty with, or even lack of, healthy emotional bonding. Denial of cultural heritage. Poor or irregular contact or the absence of contact with family. Extensive alcohol or drug abuse that crosses generations. Overrepresentation in prison populations due to mental health effects and other ways that intergenerational trauma is experienced and expressed within families. These are just some of the ways the trauma continues to be passed through generations. Removing children from their homes to send them to residential school or to be adopted by non-Indigenous families led to significant loss of language and culture. This left many people unable to communicate with their own families. Today, many young people are attempting to reconnect with their language and reconnect to cultural and traditional activities. Disproportionately higher levels of peer, spousal, community, and state violence, and witnessing these increased levels of violence adds to the layers of intergenerational trauma experienced in communities. Chronic health issues, including diabetes, mental health challenges, depression, some of these are genetically related to attendance at residential schools in which experiments were conducted, children were starved, and their bodies are now exhibiting physical illness 
as one of the outcomes of intergenerational trauma. Pervasive generational poverty. Higher rates of suicide when compared to the national average, which again contributes to ongoing traumatic effects. Different people respond to trauma in different ways, and therefore the ways in which trauma is passed through generations will differ depending on each individual, their experiences, their circumstances, and their resiliency factors. However, there are some consistent ways in which intergenerational trauma tends to affect individuals. Things to look for include depression, anxiety, anger, emotional numbing, hypervigilance and deep distrust of others, fixation on trauma, somatization, survivor guilt, re-victimization by those in authority, fear of authority and intimacy, domestic and lateral violence. Based on mental health information statistics published by the Government of Canada in 2006, suicide rates in Indigenous communities vary between 6 and 11 times the Canadian average. Depression in First Nations people has been found to be twice the national average at 16%. Fewer Indigenous people use alcohol, 66%, than the national average, 76% yet more reported as a problem within their own family or household. 75% reported as a problem within their community, 33% indicating that it is a problem within their own household, and 25% identifying themselves as struggling personally with alcohol use. There are a few possible reasons for these higher rates of mental health concerns in Indigenous populations, including the ongoing trauma, wealth inequality, racism, and inequity experienced within social structures, and of course, intergenerational effects of trauma within families and communities alike. I don't like to talk about intergenerational trauma without also mentioning intergenerational resilience. Because despite a history that has been quite traumatic, Indigenous peoples continue to survive and thrive. Resilience can be thought of as personal, family, and community characteristics that contribute to a person's abilities to thrive in the face of adversity. Much like trauma, resilience can be also passed down through generations, biologically, environmentally, and socially. Some sources or evidence of Indigenous resilience include people across the nation reconnecting with their language. Language carriers are teaching young people in their communities to keep the language alive. This is often a huge source of strength, pride, and connectedness. Connection to traditional activities, hunting, trapping, snaring, medicinal knowledge, ceremonies like powwow, sweat lodge ceremony, Sundance ceremony, and so on. Cultural connectedness has been associated with improved outcomes for Indigenous children, adolescents, and adults. Community connections. Intergenerational trauma is at the root of many of the mental health effects that are experienced by First Nations people across this nation. This series will take a closer look at how some of this history of trauma relates to the following concerns with practical tips on how to identify issues, manage them, and how to access help when it is beyond your own coping resources. Thank you for watching today. Like and subscribe to our videos and follow us for more in this series. Their uh, whole entire series is a great resource um, on looking- Bonjour. Hi. My name is Jasmine Peterson. And intergenerational trauma. Um, any thoughts based on the material in, how do I get out of this? Um, in the video on my earlier question, what is the intersectionality between, how do they intersect epigenetics and inter intergenerational or historical trauma? There's not a right answer. There's lots of right answers. So, can you help me with that to the slide? Thank you. Did anyone hear in the in the video anything that um, resonated or made sense to you based on what we had just discussed with epigenetics? I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. It's really interesting to, I, I joke all the time because I primarily work with trauma survivors in my private practice and I'll joke all the time, like 
you can come in and worst case scenario the shit out of any situation because your baseline is kind of a chronic state of hyper arousal. Therefore, when there are natural disasters, when there are emergencies, when there are huge traumas, everyone else comes up to where you are and you already have a lot of experience there. And I wanna be surrounded by trauma survivors in any natural disaster, because they will get us where we need to go and get us all the things to survive. Bougie. Oh, you're good. I know. So this recognition, yeah, Ashley. Uh, Which is interesting because epigenetics impacts that, right? Methylation process and demethylation process will impact the way I can navigate a really traumatic experience. But there is a cost, stressors to the genes. Yeah. Uh, from the chat, Casey says, this makes a lot of sense for me because a lot of women in my family have been through a lot of domestic violence for many years. I never got to see that growing up too much, but I've heard so many stories of their trauma that their trauma has become my trauma. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, beautiful. Casey, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. That was a really great point, Casey, because especially the younger children are when they're exposed to the trauma of the adults. They have far fewer resources to navigate what they're hearing. And so their, their genes get marked with the intensity of trying to sit with that, to sort it out and figure it out. Casey, that was actually a really beautiful intro to our next concept, but you had your hand raised. To go back to the original question, and that, mm -hmm. this is mainly so I can make sure I'm understanding it too. And the question was, how are the two different but intertwined, right? Yeah. And the the intergenerational trauma and the so the way I'm understanding it is that intergenerational trauma is what's actually happened to you. Um, and the epigenetics is a part of like what those events, the events that <laughs> happen to you and how it affects your DNA. It, yeah, how it affects whether your, your genetic predisposition will get activated or not activated. So excellent. Really, really, really beautiful summary. Did everybody hear that? Everyone hear that on the chat? She, she summarized this idea that generational trauma is what's happened to your family or your ancestors. Epigenetics is how that trauma or environmental um, experience impacted um, what gets activated or not activated in your genetic history. Um, anyone else have thoughts or comments about that? The other thing that's interesting back to Ashley's point is that we will actually see scenarios where someone has a high propensity for like cancer genes or diabetes um, and they are exposed to trauma in such a way that their resiliency um, kicks in and demethylates their genes. Now that's not ideal, right? We, we um, I think we, we uh, love to have those conversations where it's like, yeah, but look how resilient you are. And then I've seen all these memes on all the social medias that are like, you know what, screw resilience. Like, I just want to have all children have happy, peaceful lives. And I'm like, I'm on board with that. I'm so on board with that. And yet the truth of living on our planet doesn't actually allow that. And we can do everything in our power, which is our job. We're going to talk more about what our job is in that. But, um, but the, the biology of it does actually kick in and help us more frequently than it doesn't. Um, Tally, uh, there was, it seemed like there was some good energy back there. Any thoughts or comments? I love your energy, sisters. So, we're, uh. so all of us work in shelters. Mm -hmm. the shelters, you see. 
mother and children, or sometimes even other generations, but we were discussing how usually in the shelter there's some kind of crisis going on, like the diabetics are there, or women are fighting, or there's always something like kids, we would watch them, they'd be so just chill, you know, like nothing was a ride, normal to so be in a constant state of <coughs> panic that some people might be like, oh, look, there's something sleeping. Yeah, and more likely they're hypo aroused, right? More likely they're hypo aroused in the dynamic. But but where resiliency does come out of that is they have a high tolerance for being hypo aroused. They have a high tolerance for being hyper aroused. That it's neither good nor bad, it just is. Um, okay, so that all being said, how do I get back to my slide? This, it's not letting me, oh, perfect. Well, we already did our break, sorry, everyone. Um, we are gonna have another break though. So intergenerational trauma defined is the impact of a traumatic experience, back to what you said. Remind me your name. Michelle. Michelle. I don't think I knew your name. Michelle. All right. Michelle explained earlier to us the impact of a traumatic experience, not only on one generation, but on subsequent generations after the event. It's also referred to as transgenerational trauma. What other things do we see impacting children besides methylation and demethylation? Who said it? Casey said it in the chat. I heard about my mom, aunts, grandma's um, domestic violence for so long that I ingested it in. I ingested it into my nervous system. What other impacts are there from other people's trauma on developing brains? What, what types of impacts are there besides epigenetically? What types of impacts do we see from generational trauma? Uh, yep, so back to my client earlier, her mom never touched her. She had so much aversion to being touched. And when she became a mom, she, it was really difficult for her to touch her own children. She did a lot of great work, like increasing her tolerance for that, but it was not her go-to to bond with her child and increase oxytocin and cortisol movement that strengthens genes genetically to avoid cancer, to avoid... Um, the the impact of um, disease. Rochelle. From the chat, Nora says that it impacts your personal life. Aubrey talks about health problems. Um, Jaden saying it affects relationships. And Anna says learning the ways from your family manages conflict. How your family manages conflict. Uh, beautiful to all of that. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly. We, the way children learn how to navigate conflict or even navigate their emotions is by what is taught to them. So I, um, I, I always jokingly will say, my brother and I always joke that we can feel our mom in a building or in a room before we actually see or hear her, we just feel her. And that's not a joke. Like, our nervous systems develop in the context of the womb, right? So my nervous system is really attuned to my mom's nervous system. I can feel her angst. I can feel her, her, her um, most profound coping skill is avoidance. Um, so like I can feel her detach. And as a child, before I had any words to navigate that or talk about that, um, all I felt was this like sense of isolation and abandonment, which creates hyperarousal, right? Or hypoarousal. So we'll see children, back to Tally's point, we'll see children 
adjusting to that. We'll see children adjusting to this idea that I, I'm alone. I see you here, but it's confusing to me because I don't feel you here. I'm the only one coming. I'm never, I mean, we're three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds that turn into 40-year-olds. Never ask for help. Do not trust that grownups can show up for them. My experience of that as a child, let alone take the science into it, if I don't have the oxytocin release into my bloodstream that helps strengthen my stress responses, that's impacting um, my health outcomes, right? Now, whenever we're looking at intergenerational trauma, it's so important to me to say this, and I say this over and over and over again with my clients, because my clients are like, why do I have to tell you what I know about my grandparents and my great grandparents and my mom? I came here to tell you I'm really depressed. And I'm like, well, um, I hear you and, and we're absolutely going to get there, but I actually need some of the background to help me understand how your nervous system learned to respond to all of this. And, and what I find with people is oftentimes they just feel so much relief in this didn't start with me. It's not mine. This is not a, this is not a, a, um, a um, flaw or imperfection in me. It's, this is what I was exposed to and it's what I adapted to. And if I want something different, we're gonna practice learning it and it is gonna be really uncomfortable in the beginning. I deeply crave love. I'm wildly uncomfortable with it. People will talk about this in more layman's terms, like I sabotage relationships or rather I'm physiologically wired for love and connection. And it terrifies me. I don't know how to be present with it. We see this a lot with couples that um, I see funny memes that are like, um, there's no one I'd rather sit in bed next to and look at my phone with. And it's kind of like, like cell phones, like constant access to information and streams of information have allowed us to kind of homeostasis and not ever have to be present in our discomfort. We don't have to be present in our discomfort. We don't need to pick up alcohol or, you know, porn or some other big distraction because we can just grab our phones and like, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to think about that. So it's, it's just really interesting. Um, how some of our technology has influenced and impacted this as well. A lot of times when um, kids will get an ADD or an ADHD diagnosis, and uh, Tess Lessman talks a lot about this. From her perspective, she's like, I, I think there's a lot of misdiagnosing happening because there's really low tolerance. Back to Tally and the, the table in the corner, back to their point of like, I, I learned how to survive and the chaos is familiar to me. It doesn't mean I like it. I know what to do with it. When it's quiet, my nervous system gets heightened and I'm not totally sure what to do with it. So I'm moving around a lot and I'm trying to recreate this homeostasis. Um, so the generational transmission of trauma, we'll see survivors. So direct traumatic experience. And then the children of survivors, we see emotional distance. And like they said in the chat, challenge with conflict, right? So early on, I learned the way you handle conflict is you avoid people. You never talk to them again. That was like what was modeled for me. I didn't have any cognitive awareness of that. I had felt awareness of that. And, and what's interesting is like, as I aged, I recognized like, oh my gosh, my neighbor like irritates me so much and they're dead to me. Like I've never even thought about them again. This, this is not particularly helpful to relationship sustainability, right? Um, but recognizing I learned some of these skills in the environment, things that I was in. Um, with the next generation, oftentimes we'll see strange moods within the family, feelings of guilt um, and anxiety that we don't necessarily always know how to explain. Um, so how does a caregiver's trauma impact a child's development? So right up here, we've got, um, I mean, there are lots of different things. We're going to talk about fetal development, 
So if a mother, and also I want to be really tender with all the mothers in the room because um, it, mothers are a child's first home, right? So they get a lot of their, um, their uh, nervous system development based on what's, um, what's communicated through the host or the mother, right? But also a lot of this is inherited genetically as well through the father. So um, when we're looking at these ideas, we're never, ever, ever looking at who's to blame. We're looking at how do I understand how this has impacted me? So um, when caregivers have traumatic experiences, the mother releases a lot of cortisol, the, the stress hormone into the bloodstream. The baby absorbs the cortisol through the placenta, and this can impact the baby's HPA access or their, um, their stress response, um, their central nervous system, limbic system, autonomic nervous system. And how does this then show up in adulthood? A person who's had a caregiver with untreated trauma may be more prone to PTSD, struggle to repair after conflict. That's me. I, I have done a lot of work around it. Struggle with relationships. Um, they may also unintentionally bring out negative behaviors in others. So back to that, my homeostasis is a little bit of chaos. People abandon me, people hurt me. I don't trust grownups. So I wanna kind of push into that to see how bad it is so I can identify my level of safety, all of this unconscious. Um, they might be emotionally detached um, and, and more prone to dissociate. I, I missed the other side. So um, on the top early development, caregivers struggle to regulate attachment relationships between caregiver and child might be strained can impact the child's development of a core sense of self, ability to integrate experiences and epigenetic expressions. How well things get methylated or demethylated. The good, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> the good news is there are ways we can really intentionally disrupt this cycling the way that this plays out. First, we have to develop awareness that it's happening, which is why it was so exciting to me when Rochelle asked me to present on epigenetics, because if nothing else, the hundred and I don't know, 25 of you um, that are, uh, that are um, participating in this training are now thinking about some of your own experiences not as a way to blame, but it's simple things like, I think about stories of my grandpa during the depression. I think about my other grandpa um, in World War II. Um, I think about the ways these different things have shown up in my family. And it's in that process that we can get support with understanding what of this could have impacted the way I experience and navigate things. The more awareness I have in that, the more options I have to navigate it. So right now we're, we're focusing on the interpersonal aspect of intergenerational trauma. We are gonna switch to the provider role. But traumatic events that may lead to intergenerational trauma are parental incarceration, divorce, alcohol use disorders, domestic violence, child abuse, natural disasters, and then of course, historical events, native genocide, slavery, and Holocaust. Most of you in this room are drawn to helping professions because you too have known suffering. So it wouldn't be shocking to me if some of you could identify some things on there that have existed with your families. And also it's actually not shocking to me that that it's shocking to me when no one has any awareness of any of those things in their families or their ancestors. Usually they don't know of things in their families and with their ancestors. Um, so on that note, we're gonna break into small, actually small breakout groups. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what do you know? For some of you, this may be the first time you've thought of it. For others of you, you know, maybe you've done years of therapy, attachment therapy, where you're like exploring this on the regular. 
you don't have to share anything you don't want to share. And one of the things that's been really real in my life, this is a, a um, not small self-disclosure, um, about five years ago, um, my dad passed away via suicide. And in that process, all my siblings have very different reactions to the experience. Um, in that process, it was really difficult for me to find information. Like I had known my dad struggled with mental health and would go years and years and years without talking to us. Um, it, it had lots of manic phases, um, was really violent. I'd known all these things, but it was really hard for me to get anybody to talk about his childhood, to get my grandparents to talk about anything. Um, he, had, he had another sibling that also died the same way. And so obviously there's, there are some dynamics in this that are really important to understand, right? And for me, I would get really angry because I'm like, I really want to know whatever you guys know because this is my life and my epigenetics and my history and my children's epigenetics and history. And I'm not interested for the sake of judgment. I'm interested for the sake of understanding. And after like communicating that over and over and over again, I did get to know a lot about that my dad had an early childhood sexual abuse history, really intense. There were some massive attachment dynamics that impacted um, bonding with his own parents. All four of my great grandparents living through the depression, navigating enormous posterity, all four were alcoholics. Um, coming to this information was actually really helpful to me was really helpful to me to understand. Like, I remember trying to talk to my dad when I was little and be like, dad, dad, like, and he was so dissociative. And understanding this was super empowering to me. It was like, okay, this is our history. My, some of my siblings have absolutely zero interest in it. They are like, that whole situation is dead to me. But in uncovering it and exploring it, it's helped me really understand some of my own coping, the ways that that, that shows up in my own life. And also being able to talk to my children differently about their own experiences with emotion, their presence, their ability to give feedback. Um, so in the process of discovering some of this information, it, it can actually be really sad and really painful. It's also really helpful to understand like what what are we navigating here um so you are going to break into small groups again this is not group therapy so so no one has to share anything they don't want to share but the things that i want you to start considering are what do you know about your grandparents and parents experience with stress or trauma or or what kinds of wars have they lived through? What was the depression like for them? These events are not that far removed. Looking at their involvement, what their socioeconomic status was, how did some of the, what are just some basic information? We're not looking to blame, we're looking to understand. If you don't know a lot about your parents or grandparents' stress and trauma, what is that like for you? It was absolutely infuriating for me to get anyone to talk. <laughs> um, how do you handle stress? How do you cope similarly or differently to your parents and grandparents? If you don't know a lot about your parents or grandparents coping, what do you know about your own? And do you think it matters? Why or why not? I mean, that's so, such a, a leading question because I just gave you a bunch of explanations about why it does matter. But did you think it mattered prior to some of this dialogue and conversation? So we are gonna break into small groups you are gonna have, um, I'll kind of keep an eye out, um, but let's take like seven or eight minutes to just start thinking about this. Again, you don't need to share. I want you to think about it more than anything if you don't feel comfortable sharing. Um, so five to seven minutes, we're gonna start thinking about what types of things did my parents live through? What do I mean about different traumas that it feels like they're similar responses with our three familial backgrounds. 
Yeah. Yeah. So what's your name? Lydia. So Lydia said that um, it seemed like there were some themes um, in some of the trauma responses and coping that felt like maybe they were generationally linked. Yeah. From the chat, a lot of hey, great exercise. It was fun. Um, they liked listening to everyone's story. You made them realize that it's alone. And then Jane said, in their group, one common theme was that many of us had parents or grandparents that felt like these things just shouldn't be discussed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I resonate with that on so many levels, even in, it's, it's funny, like even in asking my mom very direct questions, immediately she'll be like, why? Why are you asking that? What? Like, like there's a fear of, of um, being blamed. And, I, and I'm always trying to hold that with a lot of tenderness. I just want to understand. Um, and I, I think that's helpful to all of us especially with like when, when I'm sitting across from a client, I'm like, we're going to talk a little bit about your history because it gives me a foundational understanding of how you might've learned to cope. And that's so important. We're never asking to figure out who to blame or what went wrong. We're trying to understand how did we have to cope in this to get through it? Yeah. I know it's not because I've experienced that I, for example, did with a of my, uh, like I grew up and did my daughter, you know? We talked about the family and the, and the experiences that my brother uh, says are totally different than mine. Yeah. You know? And for him, I don't know, negativity, and for me, it's a lot of possibility. And it's, that move, you know? Yeah. It's the same environment, but how the different uh, like people take the, the situation yeah. in the family because there are, it's the same experience, yeah. but how you take that is very, very different. Great comment. This comment about um, my brother will talk about things from a very different perspective than I will. And the assertion was made that it was the same environment and very similar DNA. But I would actually, Rochelle, if there was ever um, opportunity for a um, uh, uh, the psychology of birth order and psychology of, um, but really the psychology of birth order and how um, different children experience things differently. Um, for example, I'm not going to ask what your birth, or, birth order is, but I have some assumptions about it. Um, when, when we look at like studies of um, monkeys, so monkey, the very first monkey in the environment always has more. It has more access to resources, more attention, more presence, more affection. Um, so I would argue the environment is not the same. As more children are introduced to the environment, the environment changes. And so that will impact the way we, um, our, our genes um, and our coping and our stress, or so that it's, it's funny, my, um, I have my oldest brother, always says, I got the very best of dad. There was just one of me and it was me and him. And every single one of us agree with that. You did, you did get the best of dad. And that recognition, sometimes it flips the other way. If I'm the oldest and I'm raised in an environment where coping involves a lot of criticism, I'm holding a lot of criticism on my own. When other children are introduced or just, again, psychology of birth order, um, that can shift and change that dynamic as well. But excellent comment, really great question. Um, we mostly see it in studying rats and monkeys because they have the most similar nervous systems to humans. Any other comments, thoughts? Yes, and then yes. Let's just kind of from the chat. One of them was talking about how <coughs> when you get partners and then the commingling of the different traumas. In marriage mm -hmm. creates a new trauma system. Man, that is the truth. 
So we're going to talk about what you can do with that in just a minute um, from an interpersonal perspective. Thank you. That was a great comment. Um, in the back. I was just going to echo that thing we talked about that as well, like the first order. Yeah. Um, and like, I think I haven't really thought about like this with my mom raising me as 10 year old or, you know, like 20 for her raising my youngest brother. They're like 40, you know, like it, 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 the environment's different. The, you know, the school, the school he goes to, his friends, you know, are him being at home with so many sisters. Like, there's so many things to factor. Yeah. And it's a different environment. Yeah. Yeah. So it methylates your genes. It's a different environment. Thank you. That was great. Okay. So <clears throat> was there another hand that I missed? Okay. Um, all right. So I'm actually going to have us skip this video um, for right now. We might get a chance to come back to it, but I want to make sure we're really touching on what is required for healing. Oh, how much time do we have? Okay. I'm not, I actually am going to show that video. I'm going to skip the last one and just explain it to you. Is that okay if we watch this one? Yeah. And they have Videos. Okay. So this is a, a woman that she's a she's a pediatrician, but she works. She does an enormous amount of work in the field of trauma, but she makes a really powerful case for why she needed to really understand her own intergenerational dynamics um, to do the work that she does. And we're going to shift gears a little bit into that. Imagine a little boy, the second of five children in a middle-class family. His name is Billy. Now, Billy was a smart, sensitive, and funny guy who loved to play tricks on his siblings, and he was very close to his dad. As a matter of fact, Billy's dad was his rock. When Billy was a freshman in college, his dad died suddenly and unexpectedly of a massive heart attack. And Billy took it hard. Eventually, he started experimenting with drugs and quickly found his drug of choice, heroin. Unfortunately, Billy's addiction continued until he almost died of kidney failure. But over the course of the next decade, he was able to reunite with his family and even though he had not been very present when his own kids were growing up, he was a favorite of his grandkids who all called him Paw Paw. Billy died two years ago, but I learned a lot from him. I learned how trauma and loss can derail a person, robbing them of their life's potential. And I was puzzled. How could someone from such a good family end up with a heroin addiction? And I know many families in America are grappling with the same question now during the opiate epidemic. But the reason this bothered me and kept me looking is that what you don't know is Billy was my brother. I am a physician who specializes in treating eating disorders and addictions, but what I really do is work with survivors of trauma because the vast majority of my patients with eating disorders and addictions have experienced abuse and neglect, witnessed violence, and suffered numerous losses, most before the age of 18. And that can be devastating. For example, adolescents with a history of abuse and neglect are three times more likely to have a drug and alcohol problem than those without. What's true as well is that these individuals come from families where parents and grandparents have also experienced 
significant trauma. This is what's called intergenerational trauma. Now the Buddhists have a saying that pain is part of the human condition. That means at some point in our lives, most of us will experience trauma, pain, or loss, or some adversity. Raise your hand if you or someone you know has experienced trauma, loss, or adversity in life. Thank you. The essence of trauma, though, is a loss of a sense of security, safety, trust, and vitality. And what trauma ultimately does is hijack a person's potential in life. Now, as a physician, the scientist in me wanted to know how could the effects of trauma be passed from one generation to children and grandchildren. And while research is still ongoing, what we do know is childhood trauma does not change the DNA. But the science of epigenetics is showing that it can change the expression of a gene. So the genes for addiction, obesity, depression can be turned on by early life adversity. And this change in gene expression can then be passed to the next generation. This is what's called epigenetic memory. Now, when I looked at my family tree, a tree filled with highly educated, loving, solidly middle-class people, I was shocked to see that it was riddled with trauma and the results of trauma, mental illness, obesity, addictions, and more, all going back generations, all the way back to slavery. And I became determined some might even say obsessed, with ending the cycle of trauma in my family. Now, you can imagine having a sister, mother, or auntie like me giving you advice whether you want it or not. Eat your veggies. And did you take those supplements I sent you? And what are you going to do about healing your trauma? But seriously, the enigma of hidden trauma is something I see in my patients with eating disorders and addictions all the time who go into treatment and then relapse again and again and again because their trauma was never addressed. Studies show that 85% of those with addictions who stop using a drug will start using again within just one year. When people talk about trauma, it usually takes on the form of all the harm that it causes. And while this is true and important to acknowledge, I'm here to tell you that there are many gifts that can come from trauma, even the trauma that's passed down through the generations. And the biggest gift of all is being able to own your entire life experience. For me personally, exploring the effects of intergenerational trauma in my family brought up so many memories that I had put aside or blocked. Growing up in the segregated South with the colored only signs, going to segregated schools, <coughs> I was a little black girl who felt safe and secure as a part of my community. But the outside world was a different story. When I was little, my mama took me shoe shopping, and a white lady in the store came up to her and said, where did you get that pretty little white girl from? And she didn't believe it when my mother told her that I was her daughter. And my child mind wondered, where do I belong? Going to the bank with my grandfather, I saw how this proud, successful man who was a pillar of the black community was treated by the white bankers. And I wondered, will this happen to me one day? 
And then in the 60s, during the Black Power era, when everyone was proudly sporting their Afro hairdos, I couldn't get an Afro to save my life. <laughs> and yes, I tried those tiny little pink foam rollers, and I even got a perm. Just think cloud of frizz when you think of me with a perm. <laughs> but over time, my identity as a black woman seemed less and less important. It was like a, a scarf that had just been blown away in a high wind. I didn't feel like I should chase it. I didn't even think I needed it. But in understanding the effects of intergenerational trauma dating back to slavery in my own family, I, became, I began to reconnect with my roots as a black woman and reclaim the stories of my ancestors. This is who I am, all of it. Now, while research has a long way to go to prove the mechanism of intergenerational trauma, Intuitively, many people are starting to recognize patterns in their own families. <coughs> I'd like to share an example of this. I have a patient who's a middle-aged woman with a drinking problem. Her mother is a survivor of the Holocaust who coped with her own trauma by shutting down all of her emotions. This inability to connect emotionally is what's called psychic numbing. But my patient experienced this as emotional abuse and neglect. And when she had children, she continued the same emotionally distant parenting style with, with which she had been parented. And by the third generation, the granddaughter is asking, what's wrong with me? Why can't I handle my problems? And the original trauma is so far removed that she doesn't even understand why. And this emotionally distant parenting style is now the normal parenting style for this family. And unless interrupted, it will continue on into the next <coughs> generation. Now, perhaps you're wondering, well, why does this matter? What does this have to do with me? I don't have these problems. But what we do know is that <coughs> early life adversity, adverse childhood experiences are common. The Center for Disease Control Adverse Childhood Experiences study has shown that two-thirds of all American households have at least one adverse childhood experience. And one in five have three or more. That means in a room of 100 people, 66 would have had at least one adverse childhood experience, and 20 would have had three or more. And this is important because we now know that a history of adverse childhood experiences is associated with an increased risk for addictions, depression, anxiety, obesity, and over 40 <coughs> medical conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Now, despite this, these traumas can be like buried treasure. Hold on, I don't pump the brakes for a minute. You may be wondering, how could something so awful be a treasure. I know, I wondered the same thing. But this loss of a sense of security, safety, vitality, and trust can be healed. We can restore relationships within our families. And instead of asking, what's wrong with you? We can change the question to, what happened to you? Easy for me to say, right? Well, I'm passionate about this because I've had to go through this process myself. My own early life adversities and numerous losses made me the prototype for the strong black woman syndrome. 
staying strong for everyone else led to extreme burnout in my 40s and caused difficulties in interpersonal relationships, which my two ex-husbands can tell you more about. <laughs> this happens for a lot of human service providers. <laughs> so perhaps you're wondering, what can you do if you have this in your family? What can you do? Well, number one, if you know something, share something. Share stories from your past or your family's past as a way to teach resilience to the younger generation. These are difficult topics to talk about, but not talking about them is what keeps us stuck in the past. Secondly, be a friend who's courageous enough to listen to someone who's struggling without judging and without trying to fix their problems. And finally, prevention is best. Understanding intergenerational trauma can reduce shame so that this will enable people to get help for parenting challenges, substance misuse, depression, and suicidal thoughts. What if? What if we could identify children at risk for either because of their own past or their family's past? Could we turn back the clock on the opiate epidemic, reduce the explosion of mental illness in this country? I like to think of John Lennon's song, and I want to imagine that people will reclaim their personal histories and be liberated from the weight of their past. And more than anything, I'd like to think I'd like to imagine what all this buried treasure can do for you, for me, for our country. Would we be more accepting of our differences, more compassionate with those who are struggling? There is a term in Ghana called Sankofa, which means return and get it. And you see in the picture, the bird has a precious pebble in its beak. Its feet are moving forward while its head is turning toward the past. This means in understanding who we were, that will free us to embrace all of who we are now. That's what's available to all of us by understanding and healing intergenerational wounds. Thank you. No, oh. California. It's like right outside San Francisco. Okay, so she it, it, something that she really drove home, and I don't I don't know if you heard it as the main point, but I really want us to hear it as the main point. She said, "What is required for intergenerational trail uh, intergenerational healing is discover your." story. Discover your family's story and stories, which isn't necessarily just their trauma, right? In this experience of like trying to interview my aunts and even my grandpa before he died, my, my grandpa lived like uh, four years longer than my dad. Um, I actually learned a lot of things about how they survived like what worked for them and what didn't. And I felt proud. And I saw some of those things in myself too. But what she's making the argument for is that our first responsibility in addressing intergenerational trauma is to discover your family history. Every time you go to the doctor, they're like, do you have a family history of breast cancer, heart, heart disease, blah, blah, blah. and they use that as informants, right? We have to use that in understanding the way we address conflict, the way we navigate um, connections with other people, even our comfort level with touch, um, et cetera. So consider the wars, political movements, other major family um, historical events um, 
Consider the cultural and religious values of certain eras that may have influenced your family's belief system. I can't remember who said it, but someone said um, in their family, we don't talk about these things. In my experience, it's not, not always that we don't talk about things because we're keeping secrets. Some of it is we have no language to talk about this. We have no idea how to talk about how these things impacted us what we were using the alcohol for. Alcohol is used to numb the nervous system. Heightened states of hyperarousal need help. And when there's no other resources, alcohol is a pretty good choice in terms of it's an option, right? Um, so we're, we're really uncovering our family story. What's interesting about that is it isn't just psychological. The value of that is not just psychological. So Renda Dion, also from the indigenous community, um, member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians said, stories are how we come to understand ourselves and the world around us. For American Indians, stories are medicine. Being present with yourself and the audience and speaking from the heart. What's interesting is we've actually kind of operationalized that in, um, uh, more uh, European or white cultures as well. Um, and we typically do it through psychotherapy. So people will come in and they tell their stories. They want to tell their stories, right? And why do we feel good when we leave psychotherapy after we told a story? Because oxytocin and cortisol are released into the bloodstream when we tell our stories. Telling our stories is not enough. Like we have to understand how to work with our nervous system, work with um, some of those other things. But the value of storytelling is that, A, I mean, a couple of things based on your point earlier, I get to hear my brother talk about his experience and I get to talk about my experience. And we're not arguing who was right and wrong. We're saying, wow, how did we both walk away from the same event with such a different experience in it? Um, oftentimes families are not in a position to understand each other in that dynamic. And so finding good circles of friends, therapists, communities. I have a client that, um, oh my gosh, her level of, she, she had four perpetrators before she was 10 years old. Um, her dad was one of them and her grandpa was one of them. Um, and she um, drank and use substances to survive her feelings of shame and self-hatred. And when she engaged with the AA community, she said, I finally had a community to share my stories with, people that could hold it. And the value of these community-based programs is that we come and there's no expectation, you're just sharing. And I walk away with that um, demethylation experience. You had your hand up. Can I, can I just share that um, this year I had a journey of discovering and writing my own story. Yeah. My children last year gave me a story worth account. So cool, that's so, so cool. 52 chapters later, I started, I started with my grandparents, my parents, me as a baby went through my whole life having my children. I have five and I have seven grandchildren. And I have come to a discovery of myself. It's been a healing journey for me this year. And <coughs> difficult because my weekends were shot in writing two pages, you know, two long pages per chapter. Um, but I, and I am gifting my children, my adult children, uh, a copy of it, and then and then another for them to give to their children when they're at the appropriate age. Because so I talk about domestic violence, and I I talk about sexual abuse with one of my children, and I talk and so there's some heavy stuff in there. But I'm like, do I do it or do I hide it? Yeah. And so I did it, and and this is this is healing for yeah. me. Just listening to your presentation because I'm like, okay, it's gonna be okay. Maybe I'm gonna heal the intergenerational. Yep. trauma that, that my family has been suffering from and still. I, 
I love everything about that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really funny. I actually gifted my mom a story worth subscription as well because she has such a hard time talking. But I was like, she could write about it. But in her culture, her traditional faith culture, like you keep those things really hidden. She just like talks a lot about her faith and her um, testimony. And it's so hard for her to talk about her experience. And that those are barriers that we navigate in this. For sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also, I, I feel like your children are so lucky that they will get to connect their own story to your story in that. Um, so recognizing oxytocin and cortisol, which, again, remember when we were talking about epigenetics, demethylates um, gene transmission. Other places where we get oxytocin and cortisol, um, mostly oxytocin, but is in nurturing, in love and connection. Um, so the, the last part of this is live your story. So embracing our stories, really incorporating them in um, to who we are and how we got to where we are and why this matters really shifts our own experience and creates demethylation. So what does this mean for us as providers? There was a three minute clip I was gonna show you, but I'm not gonna show you. You should watch the whole thing. I'm just gonna summarize it for you. So um, there is a, he's so funny too. So you should definitely watch it. But there's this Slovakian um, Jewish man that stands up and he's an epigeneticist, he's a scientist. And he tells the story of like, he's sitting in a bar and he's talking to another scientist. And the scientist is like, I've been studying rats for the last 27 years. And the presenter is like, Shh, this is what my tax dollars pay for, studying rats. And he goes on to talk about the reparative work they're doing with rats, where they can see in their genetics that you have a high disposition for cancer, for tumor growth, for diabetes, high stress, and um, getting the rat with that um, level of uh, genetic sequencing to a mother, a mother rat that has a high propensity to lick and groom. So not taking the rat from its mother, but interweaving it. So it's with his own mother who also has a lot of those same issues and struggles with licking and grooming behaviors. But when the, the rat is brought into this, this other mother who has a different genetic experience with um, methylation and demethylation, the, the rat mother can lick and groom and create oxytocin movement in the rat's experience, which changes their ability to heal. Then they studied the exact same thing in monkeys. Then they looked at it in children. They looked at it in children where we're not actually necessarily taking children away from their families of origin, which we've seen really bad results from that, but we're introducing concepts of attachment repair. So we're introducing more licking and grooming to the rats. Um, so we are rat mothers. That's what we do as advocates. That's what we do as therapists. It doesn't mean we're good at it all the time, right? But we are rat mothers. We came into this work to do some rat mothering. And that's what we do. And here's the good news. You don't actually have to do a lot of it to change oxytocin in the bloodstream and that demethylation process. Um, we create cross fostering or attachment repair in this. So attachment um, generally speaking, is the idea that, you know, I came into the world and as I look to my parents or my primary caretakers and they are there and they're attuning themselves to me, it creates a foundation of oxytocin in the bloodstream, safety and security, a belief that human beings are safe to me. The world is safe to me. When my parents aren't in a position to do that because maybe they're working three jobs maybe they have a, a chronic trauma history themselves, it's harder for me to get those things. And then I often tend to, A, try to not want them 
or B, try to earn them, which creates methylation, increases the human stress response and makes you more susceptible to disease and toxins in the body. So there's been an enormous amount of history, done, or sorry, not history, research done on what are the bare minimums that we need to get people in attachment repair? What are they? This is what I love. There's a researcher named David Rico. He's, I, 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 he is, I, I say this all the time. He is the father that I wish I'd had. Um, he has written several books. The first one, there's a series called How to Be an Adult. The second one is called How to Be an Adult in Relationships. And the second one is called How to Be an Adult in Love. All three books are really just taking this attachment research and incorporating it in to awareness of what you need in any given moment. And he looks at it through the lens of the five A's. Children come into the world physiologically wired. This is not emotionally and this is not cognitively wired. They are wired in their bodies to seek out attention. I wanna be seen. If any of you have interacted with a three-year-old who colored a picture and wants every single one put on the fridge, you know about this. Attention. We're wired to seek out attention, affection, and love. Acceptance. I'm okay the way I am. Appreciation. What I offer matters. What I do matters. And allowing. This idea that um, I trust you to like you know, walk away or as you're learning to crawl to kind of crawl away and I'll be right there to support you, but I'm allowing you to carve out your own path with teenagers. Blah. Callie and I were just talking about that the babies we were pregnant with at the same time are now almost 14 year olds. It's like, they want to do stuff on their own and it's terrifying and it's like really hard to allow. So this is the one that's the hardest for me. But the good news is we get to offer these things in micro doses which creates oxytocin and demethylation. As we think about working um, on those with our clients. So because of the time, um, we're, we're gonna do, we're gonna do, um, I want you to consider these questions for yourself. I want you to consider a difficult client interaction you've had something that was challenging or hard. What made it difficult for you? What did you experience or feel in it? Was the client not seeing me as a human? Were they demanding? Were they triggering me with yelling, being unappreciative? What of my five A's were absolutely not getting met in the encounter? Did I not feel seen as a person? You're just a worker. Did I not feel cared about? Did I not feel appreciated for what I was trying to do? These are foundational attachment needs that flood us with oxytocin. Which of the five A's, A's were, I'm gonna go back to them, but what were potentially not being met for the client? Did they not feel seen? Did they not feel cared about? You're not responsible for that, but raising awareness of it is really helpful. Did they not feel accepted or appreciated or allowed to sort of problem solve themselves? It's in these micro exchanges that we offer the five A's. In therapy, it's so helpful to people when they'll finish something and you're like, can I make sure I understood what you said? It sounds like you said you're, you feel really angry because that person didn't honor how important that was to you. That sounds so painful. In that micro exchange, we're flooding the body with oxytocin. I see you, I appreciate your experience and you matter. This doesn't just create a nice exchange. It creates oxytocin movement in the body, which then assists with demethylation. So the other things we wanna get our clients when we have the ability to is 
What's your access like to green leafy vegetables? Like, <laughs> How much can you exercise? Things like that, they all come together. But if you take away a micro thing from this presentation today, you need all those things. And it's okay to say, I need all those things. Your clients need all those things. Your children need all those things. No parent can offer them all the time. It can't be done. No advocate can offer them all the time. It can't be done. No partner can offer them all the time. It can't be done. But where we get the repair is in those micro interactions. So because of time, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I want you to consider what does this material mean for my work? If attachment repair requires that I have awareness of the five A's, again, attention, affection. I mean, I have a handout I made about the five A's. I'm gonna send it to Rochelle and she's gonna email it out to you all. Attention, affection, acceptance, appreciation. I hear you. It's really scary when your electricity might get turned off. That's so scary. I hear you. Um, how can micro doses of that get offered in your work? And the only way we're good at it is if we're also doing it for ourselves. Um, so I obviously was really sick this morning, felt like shit. I was like, the presentation will be what it's gonna be. And you're legitimately doing the best you can. Like, I see you and I appreciate that. And I get that attachment repair with myself. And my partner on the way out the door was like, you're gonna do great. And I'm like, I might, I might not, but I feel really good about the fact that I'm trying. That recognition of incorporating the five A's into your own experience and offering it in micro doses to the people you work with. Um, Dr. Maria Braveheart, who is, um, she runs Native Hope and she has, again, incorporated so much of this research into their um, human service, um, how they provide services, she says, in our view, community healing, along with individual and family healing, are necessary to thoroughly address historical unresolved grief and its present manifestations. The process isn't quick. You might offer the five A's to someone for years before you see anything change. However, without such a commitment to healing the past, we will not be able to address the resultant trauma and prevent the continuation of such atrocities in the present. So <laughs> here are some resources. There are videos, there are books. There's my contact information. I'm always happy to chat with people. If you wanna email me, I like geek out about this stuff so much because it actually makes my job feel so much easier. It makes my job feel so much easier. I don't have to fix this for you. Part of what I can do in calming down your nervous system is literally just acknowledging how painful this is to provide attention, appreciation, acceptance. These are micro ways we can legitimately change the way people's genetic transmission is experienced in their life and in their world. And it changes things generationally. So again, I hope as you're walking out today, I hope you will take a lot of hope in this. Science is so hopeful because we know what we're doing. And we also can see in this, we don't have to radically change people's lives. I, I really wish that we would. I wish income inequality was not such a huge issue. I wish that we would look at some of the basic foundations of what people need to be well. But in our limited capacity and role as advocates, this is something we can do that literally changes people's genetic experience. So that's all I got. And I know you guys gotta go to lunch and I will stay and answer questions. You can also email or text or call me. Um, that's all my information up there. So, Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda.